Or on this computer. All right, folks. So we're entering the fourth reading of Plato's The Sophist um, as a follow-up to the previous, just as a quick reminder for those who may not, uh, who might be listening on YouTube and don't know, this is a, a follow-up to the previous Theatetus dialogue on the subject of this knowledge. Is Indeed. Um, on the subject of knowledge, what is not true knowledge versus simple right opinion? How do we know? How do we discern the difference? Sometimes they look the same, very, very similar, but there's something qualitatively different. So the Theotetus dialogue, beautiful exposition on that with the young Theotetus, um, who, you know, as may, many people make the point, has a lot of similar appearances physically to Socrates, even similar aspects of, of Socrates' essence are uh, are expressed in Theotetus. The Theotetus also, uh, who plays a big role in this current dialogue, um, as we discovered in the previous one, is, dies in battle. He's a warrior. He's a scientist warrior, a, a real figure in Plato's Academy, who the dialogue begins with his body coming back. He's on the verge of death. And then the dialogue begins with, with a couple of people re recollecting this uh, discussion that had taken place on knowledge months or whatever earlier. So this this is sort of like a, a continuation, probably the next day or something, maybe the same day. And young Theotetus is now, you know, interfacing with um, a stranger from the Eleatic school. So we've been just going through a lot of this, having a lot of discussion. The thing I love about Plato is uh, there, there's these nuggets of wisdom that he'll always embed within everything he does, you know. Um, and you're not always so sure what's what's Plato's voice, what's not, but he'll always embed these these things. So um, I'm sure Quan will have a word or two to say uh, as as well before we jump into it, perhaps. Um, but I would recommend maybe going a couple of pages back um, to something that we had read like a page or two ago as a good jump on point um, as we continue this exploration of being and becoming and like what how do we know anything? Can we know anything? Right. And also, what is 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 there such an it does not being the opposite of being have have substance or is it something else? Right? What are these states of reality? How do we know those? So I don't know, Quan. Any uh, any thoughts you'd you'd like to throw out there? Um, I hesitate a little bit, but I will take a rest. Okay, I will take three four minutes to come back if you agree, Matt, on the axial epistemopolitical triangle, because it's at the center of the sophist, really. Mm. If you guys remember, there were two uh, pedantic words that I used for the sides of the three sides of the triangle, okay? The first pedantic words at the base of a triangle is hermeneutics, and hermeneutics is the capacity to make the difference between fact, myth, and that capacity comes from the epistemological journey that you go to truth, and that truth will make you capable to make the difference between facts and myths. The other side of the triangle is uh, theory of knowledge, but I think that theory of knowledge is a fancy way to say things which is not clear. Because when I say theory of knowledge, you have to understand that I don't use the word the theory in the English meaning, meaning when we make a theory, meaning that we make a, a speculation about something, right? But here I use theory in the Greek meaning, theoria, meaning contemplation, contemplation of the pure form, goodness, truth, and beauty. And on the other side, the third segment of the triangle is heuristics, okay? Heuristics is at the core of creativity because his heuristic is precisely the capacity to, uh, to be centered on the mind processes, okay? The healthy mind processes, which make you capable to make uh, the link between the different phenomena, okay? Once again, at the core of philosophy is the one and the many, okay? The one is being, the many is a different phenomena of becoming. Heuristics is how you would understand the mechanism, <coughs> the processes of your mind, of the human mind, that would be capable to go from different phenomena that you observe at the time level and with the high principle of beauty, goodness, and truth to make discovery and to, to be critical. I stop here because I just want you to remember that this dialogue uh, as with all the about 40 dialogues by Plato, 
is about that, okay? It's about the relations between heuristics, hermeneutics, and theoria, okay? I would, I would never say theory of knowledge. I would always say theoria, so that you understand that I use that word not as a synonym of speculation, but as aware of the high principles of organization, of being, projecting as shadows into becoming. I stop mm. right here. Mm, that's good. Cool. All right. And I'm sure that it will come back with that stuff later on with the reading. <laughs> All right. So, like I said, this is page 66 of 99 of the document that we're using. Um, we've already read this, but I, uh, I thought this might be a nice spot and, and a point as well to keep in mind. Um, I was always, I've done, I've done a lot of these Plato readings over the years and I found that it's wonderful to have regular meetings, but the thing that makes this really work is what happens in between the readings. So I know for myself, I'll often make the mistake of like not thinking about what I read in the course of like the, the seven days between these reading sessions, which sort of, it doesn't do one a lot of favors because you forget a lot of things, you know, and, and Plato wants us to sort of ruminate bubble, bubble on and, and boil some of these ideas as they cook and bake inside our heads. Um, so it's good to, to review throughout the week. Think about as you're walking, you know, and you're, you're on the bus in transit or whatever, like think about some of the, the concepts, wrestle with them. Uh, write notes down as well. Write your questions down because there's a lot of questions and it's not supposed to be something that is easy to cap capture or follow necessarily as it is being read. Um, and then that way, it the roots settle a little bit more. The hypotheses about what he's what is he getting at are more formed and it has more durability. So just have that in mind between all of these readings, whether it's Plato or anything, it's, it's always good to think about the, the period in between the reading sessions. Um, as you're putting gas in the tank, you know? Um, yeah, so so here we are. Uh, in bold, I just uh, boldened where the stranger says, for surely either all things have communion with all or nothing with any other thing, or some things communicate with some things and others not. So these are three categories of possibility of how to think about um, being and and, you know, questions like change, no change, or rest in motion. Um, either, you know, either rest and motion, are they two separate things? Well, if, 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 if rest is completely, if they both participate in being, well, then they both are kind of united in, in being. If they're, if, if rest is something other than, 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 than motion, then uh, then does it participate in otherness as well as being the sameness of itself so it's the same as itself you know so you get, there's going to be a lot of these like logical sort of um syllogisms that are going to be used right so if something is the same as it's if it's the same as well as other it's the, it's the same as itself but it's the it's other something else so how could it be both the same and other right so you have these sorts of syllogisms it's good to just play play with them a little bit but now he's talking about how um, the most rational of these three, so either things have communion with everything or nothing with any other thing, right? Everything is so different that from everything else that everything is like a world of parts, but no, no whole, um, or there's some things that, that communicate with some things and others that don't communicate with something. So we're, we're going now with the third one is the most reasonable of the three possibilities. And, uh, we're going to jump in a little bit to explore that in more detail with Theotetus and the stranger. So who wants to be the stranger today and who wants to be Theotetus? And whoever is either one, we just have to speak slowly, be prepared to stop, ask questions. If we all, if anybody wants to ask a question or stop or redefine something, always fine to do. Doesn't mean we're gonna get the right answer, but it's fine to do. I can do Theotetus again, if you would like. Yeah, you did a nice Theotetus. Okay. Thank you. I like the easy part. <laughs> you, you, you channeled the young, the young boy, <laughs> the young <laughs> curious boy. Well, <laughs> all right, cool. Yeah. So, and then we need a Theotetus. No, stranger. Oh, sorry. Stranger, stranger. Sorry. That was weird. Weird glitch. 
that, that's the big part. Uh, <laughs> Paul, you do well. You do well. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll happily do it. <clears throat> yeah, a you've a, been a rough voice, but oh, you got a rough voice. You don't have to. You don't. <laughs> no, have no, to. I'm fine. I'm fine. No, late night last night. There's a... Okay, it'll take me a sentence or two to get into it, and then I'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> It just means I've, you know, uh, I've been in the habit of taking notes in these sessions. So, nah. right. It, uh, but I'll, I'll happily read for a while. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Starting from who? The stranger? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, go, go with the stranger. Okay. For surely, either all things have communion with all, or nothing with any other thing, or some things communicate with some things and others not. Certainly. And two out of these three suppositions have been found to be impossible. Yes. Everyone then who desires to answer truly will adopt the third and remaining hypothesis of the communion of some with some. Quite true. This communion of some with some may be illustrated by the case of letters, for some letters do not fit each other while others do. Of course. And the vowels especially are a sort of bond which pervades all the other letters so that without a vowel, one consonant cannot be joined to another. True. But does everyone know what letters will unite with what? Or is art required in order to do so? Art is required. What art? The art of grammar. And is not this also true of sounds high and low? Is not he who has the art to know mingle a musician and he who is ignorant not a musician yes and we shall find this to be generally true of art or the absence of art of course and as classes are admitted by us in like manner to be some of them capable and others incapable of intermixture must not rightly show what kinds will unite and what will not proceed by the help of science in the path of argument and will he not ask if the connecting links are universal and so capable of intermixture with all things, and again, in divisions, whether there are not other universal classes which make them possible. To be sure, he will require science, and if I am not mistaken, the very greatest of all sciences. Hmm. How are we to call it? By Zeus, have we not lighted unwittingly upon our free and noble science, and in looking for the sophist, have we not entertained the philosopher unawares? What do you mean? Should we not say that the division according to classes, which neither makes the same nor makes other the same, is the business of dialectical science? That is what we should say. Then surely he who can divide rightly is able to see clearly one form pervading a scattered multitude and many different forms combined, um, sorry, con contained under one higher form, and again, one form knit together into a single whole and pervading many such holes and many forms, existing only in separation yeah, and back. isolation. What's the matter? Yeah, let's just let's just wait. No, uh, okay. Yeah. Like yeah, I just I just muted here. So quick pause. Helen, you're on mute. Okay. Listen, I think I have an emergency. I have oh, to go. Okay, okay, do it. Okay, do it. Sorry. Gotta do. Oh, all's good. Sorry about okay. that. Okay. I, I can read the stranger. I mean, I'm the Theotetus. Okay, sure. It, right, unless, but actually, if not, because my internet keeps coming out. Yeah, your out. internet's not great, so, Nathan. Uh, I'll I'd try suggest, it. Let's just keep it simple. Uh, Ken, your internet's often pretty okay. You wanna you wanna read, Ken? You there, Ken? Okay, Kelly, you want to try to, uh, Kelly? You're on mute, Kelly. Uh, Theotetus? Yeah. Yeah, Theotetus. Are you okay with that? Uh, Yeah. Okay. So now we're okay, into so dialectical science and the art of division. Right. Okay. Uh, um, then surely. Is... Okay, sorry. Okay, then surely. Then, surely, he, could, he who can divide rightly is able to see clearly one form pervading a scattered multitude, and many different forms contained under one higher form. And again, one form knit together into a single whole and pervading many such holes and many forms, existing only in separation and isolation. This is the knowledge of classes which determines where they can have communion with one another and where not. 
are quite true. And the art of dialectic would be attributed by you only to the philosopher pure and true. Um, who but he can be worthy? In this region, we shall always discover the philosopher if we look for him. Like the sophist, he is not easily discovered, but for a different reason. Us, for what reason? So just quick, keep because in mind the big question that's floating overhead is, what is the sophist? Is it the same or different than the philosopher and the statesman, right? So that's always the question we've got. Like, how do we know? Um, there's obviously some overlap in all three, but there's a differentiation too. So how to proceed? That's always the, the subtle question. Okay. Because the sophist runs away into the darkness of not being in which he a habit to feel about and cannot be discovered because of the darkness of the place. Is not that true? It seems to be so. And the philosopher, always holding converse through reason with the idea of being, is also dark from excess of light. For the souls of the many have no eye which can endure the vision of the divine. I actually have a question. Uh, Quan. what's your take on that wording? I mean, it might be the translation too, which is an odd translation. It's always tough with these things from Greek. But uh, yeah, how would you, what do you think of that? Uh, may you precise the exact words that you want to discuss about? Yeah, well, I was just curious about, like, why would you would say, yeah, why would he say that uh, the philosopher always holding converse through reason with the idea of being is also dark from excess of light? And then he describes here, obviously, like, yeah, for the souls of the many have no eye which can endure the, the vision of the divine. So obviously the divine being light is not something that the souls of the many, the masses, are accustomed to thinking about through the mind's eye. But then he used the word the um the philosopher because he's always used to talking uh, or or having uh converse uh, inquiring and analyzing pure being which is pure light uh, metaphorically he's dark from excess of light what what does that mean to be dark from excess of light i, I found that a bit confusing blinded yeah. by the light oh blinded yeah. by the light yes dark from excess of light absolutely blinded uh, by the light fact. I mean, that, that, yes, okay. yes, exactly there in the description, excess of light. Yes, exactly. And I mean, is, or, is, is also dark from excess of light. I'll just take it blinded by the light. Yeah. I would like to quote to Plato. Okay. Well, remember, remember that book seven, Plato said uh, at the end of the allog allegory of the cave that when you look at the sun of the absolute, you are no more capable that you have to become it, if you remember that. Yes, but he also said in that same allegory that the true philosopher is only a true philosopher if he goes back into the cave and learns to develop discourse to, with those in the cave to help them help themselves liberate themselves from the cave. And so that means that yes. you have to be oh, not blind to the not being as well or the the darkness of no, of no, but so because evil. No, because when... When you are at uh, when you are at the at the threshold between goodness and truth, you would not be capable to look directly at the sun, and that's the metaphor that it is no more a dual relation. You have to be truth yourself, and there because. Uh, there is no relation of subject and object when you are at that threshold, okay? So the next step is you have to become that truth yourself, and there you will be capable to go back to the cave. But when you speak, it is never... If, if I go back to the six layers of the mind development, okay? As perception, the intellect using words, concepts, and images. After that, you have the psyche, which is a social and emotional sophistication. The first, the, the ten gardens of the nine muses. Okay, let's not forget that. Because when you are making your epistemological journey from three to four, you are still in the animal kingdom. But it's there that you learn the skills of language and of metaphor and of structure, okay? That's why the sophists are, are so uh, efficient because their art is an imitative art, but it's an imitative art from um, disciplines who have been created by higher people, okay? And when you go through those uh, 
10 gardens of the nine muses, you reach to the 10 form, 10 gardens, which is the true form of justice. Then you are truly in the upper kingdom. And then you will have to exercise yourself in dialectics, meaning going into deep philosophy. And there you will be creative in how to explain things precisely. But the last step is no more about how to use language, concept, or images, or symbols. The last step is truly to, maybe the word is clumsy, but that's the first one that comes to my mind now, to stabilize yourself, uh, to be rooted at the being. Then, but you cannot look at it, you have to be it. And then, because you have gone through four or five, you would be capable to return to the cave because in the transition in, at four and five, you would learn how to use the different symbols, concepts, images, words, and the dialectics to talk to the people in the cave. Hmm. Jason, yeah, uh, yeah. by the way, Jason, you could always ask. Uh, you can take yourself off of um, mute if you want. Oh, you don't have a microphone, right? That's your problem. You have no mic. Uh, so yeah, Jason just writing, uh, does he mean that the philosopher becomes jaded or isolated due to his excessive analysis of human nature? What are your thoughts on that, Juan? Uh, not. He's not jaded because precisely that is uh, the usefulness of the last uh, uh, of the last step, okay? When he is truly being and because he's rooted in that being, in that infinite awareness okay because let's not forget that the dialect uh, as I, what i said the, during my presentation on the aristocratic education okay the ironical lesson is that we are a bio machine in dialectical dance with infinite awareness okay that is another way to say the one and the many okay or the infinite and the finite so the infinite and the finite or the one or the money is precisely that infinite awareness versus the finite, the phenomenon that we deal with. And that last step of uh, from the state of the aristocratic man to the philosopher king, to use Plato terminology, since we are reading one of his dialogues, will make that person completely rooted in infinite awareness and that person who is rooted in infinite awareness cannot be jaded and cannot be isolated because it is from that infinite awareness that he would be capable to use the many dialectical methods and the many symbols, images, concepts coming from the 10 gardens of the nine muses to explain to people precisely the steps of the epistemological journey. If he did not transform himself into being, he might be discouraged by the Leviathan-esque task precisely. You can go with that. All right. So thank you for the clarification on this uh, interesting little statement and choice of wording. Um, all right, let's... Uh, Let's continue onward uh, with the Atidas. Yes, that seems to be quite as true as the other. Well, the philosopher may hereafter be more fully considered by us if we are disposed. But the sophist must clearly not be allowed to escape until we have had a good look at him. Very good. Since then, we are agreed that some classes have a communion with one another and others not and some have communion with a few and others with many, and that there is no reason why some should not have universal communion with all, let us now pursue the inquiry, as the argument suggests, not in relation to all ideas, the multitude of them should confuse us, but let us select a few of those which are reckoned to be the principal ones and consider their several natures and their capacity of communion with one another in order that, if we are not able to apprehend with perfect clearness the notions of being and not being, we may at least not fall short in the consideration of them, so far as they come within the scope of the present inquiry, if peradventure we may be allowed to assert the reality of not being and yet escape unscathed. Uh, we must do so. The most important 
of all the genera are those which we were just now mentioning, being and rest and motion. Yes, by far. And two of these are, as we affirm, incapable of communion with one another. Quite acceptable, quite incapable. Whereas being surely has communion with both of them, for both of them are. Of course. That makes up three of them. To be sure. And each of them is other than the remaining two, but the same within itself. Uh, true. But then, what is the meaning of these two words, same and other? Are they two new kinds other than the three, and yet always of necessity with them? And are we to have five kinds instead of three? Or when we speak of the same and other, are we unconsciously speaking of one of the th three first kinds? Just well, quick, guys. Uh, this is always ideal to uh, to have like a piece of paper. If you're going to re read this on your own, either re if someone if you guys are just listening in, this this will be confusing. These are tautologies. These are these are some in some cases yep. these are syllogisms. In other cases, um, they're not always necessary. You have to think about them to sort of follow his line of logic in these different hypotheses. These are not the final answer to anything. They're introducing hypotheses about something very very um, important, and it's always useful to have like a, a blank piece of paper because it's very visual as well. So to to just draw. Out, it helped me at least to have like these different things like in this case you know he's he's speculating that you know like rest and motion and being are three separate entities and then you could and then he's building a logic on top of that assumption right wondering does rest and motion are they both being are they both do they both have equal claim to be to being or are they separate things what about otherness as he's going to get into so again drawing this out kind of helps just to say uh, just, just uh, may I interrupt? Yes. Uh, it is a very typical example of what is the higher philosophical exercise called dialectics, okay? Because we are really in the heart of dialectics, and it is not the ordinary stuff in mm -hmm. philosophy. It takes a lot of concentration and of uh, imagination and op openness of mind. So. Matt's advice is absolutely spot on. The other thing too, motion, thing to motion as a synonym of change, okay? At least for me, it makes it easier when I think to motion as change, but maybe not every not everyone think the same. But if in certain phrases, you think that motion is a little bit strange, put change at the place of motion, it can help you. That's all. Um, i like mm -hmm. to just say with uh, motion, it, it all depends on how you look at it. Like if you're looking at it from a different perspective, that motion could be um, stillness. And um, like it could be like, the it could look like it's not moving at all, it, which could yeah. be at rest. And as well, uh, sameness, um, things look the same, but if we really look at them closer, like at, like uh, like in a microscope, we can see the differences between those samenesses. I, I just want to throw that in. Well, that that's good to come at it from the standpoint that there's the 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 sensual, uh, like the so there's the there's the type of reality we can map using our senses, and certain words will be used according to that and then there's seeing through the higher faculties which is why I, I wanted to start a little bit earlier the way we did where he took the time to emphasize that the musician or the the, the person who has mastered the art of grammar has a higher faculty of judgment and discernment right that allows them to know it's like a it's like a higher sense beyond the five senses a sense of knowing a harmony a sense of knowing what notes work don't work a higher sense of knowing what vowels and what consonants work or don't work um these higher faculties have to come into play because they're not located in the sen sensual domain because they're they're participating a little bit more in that higher realm that higher state of reality um so that's just a a useful thing to have in mind usually we we don't have that differentiation of the two realities when we're exploring one of these things and so we're we without that we become much more susceptible 
to fallacies, uh, which are very easy to to make these mistakes, you know, when we don't just think suppose. about the difference of becoming and being enough and the higher That's powers. That's where it helps us to study. Uh, we were talking about all the, the muses, the, the nine muses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the mu were. yeah, exactly. The nine muses are cultivating <clears throat> our higher senses, our, our sense of humor, our sense of poetry, our sen are those higher instincts, right? Yeah. Uh, insights. Uh, very likely we are. Very likely oh, we are. <laughs> but surely motion and rest are neither the other nor the same. How is that? Whatever we attribute to motion and rest in common cannot be either of them. Uh, why not? Because motion would be at rest and rest in motion for either of them being predicated will compel the other to change into the opposite of its own nature because partaking of its opposite. That's uh, quite true. They surely both partake of the same and of the other. Yes. Then we must not assert that motion, any more than rest, is either the same or the other. Uh, no, we must not. But are we to conceive that being and the same are identical? Um, possibly wasn't the answer I was expecting. Never mind. But if they are identical, then again, in saying that motion and rest have being, we should also be saying that they are the same. Which surely cannot be. Then being and the same cannot be one. Uh, scarcely. Then we may suppose the same to be a fourth class, which is now to be added to the three others. Uh, quite true. And shall we call the other a fifth class? Or should we consider being an other to be two names of the same class? Oh, very likely. But you would agree, if I am not mistaken, that existences are relative as well as absolute. Uh, certainly. And the other is always relative to other. True. But this would not be the case unless being and the other entirely differed. For if the other, like sorry, being, just were absolute, oh, you're gonna. I'm gonna get you to re redo that. But does somebody have an example? Just a examples always help. That that's why Socrates always likes going for examples because a lot a lot of times in the the interlocutors within the dialogues will often uh, go for broad imagery, broad. You know, they they want to go for broad generalities to make their points, and 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 they get frustrated with Socrates because he's always trying to like bring it back to like well. Can you give me an example? And they're like, no, I like my gender. So it's good because it, it sort of adds flesh to the bone. It gives you something to hold on to. Or, or, um, so for when he's talking about here, uh, existences are relative as well as absolute. Does somebody have an example of uh, what that could look like? An existence which is both relative or absolute. That would, I can think uh... of Reference not sameness. Hmm? I mean, no, I'm talking about not about sameness. I mean, like an example of something. Oh, okay, well, go on. What do you, when you say sameness, what do you mean? Like Nathan? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I can't think of an example, so I think maybe mm. <laughs> because yeah, it, yeah. you know how postmodern try to well, tr try to. Uh, wash out any any differences by simply creating an infinite line of um relativity so to speak okay let me ask um, it this way do you, do, you, do you have an Try example, you, I can give an example, example of an ex of something okay. that, that is an existence which is both relative as well as absolute kelly has has an example go, go ahead kelly well, i'm thinking of like the color like i'm looking at a book here and it's brown okay um but if I get a magnifying glass and I look at it really closely, I see reds, and greens, and yellows. Ah, okay. Um, that's just something that came to my head. Okay. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. Yeah. Yes. And something might look more and or less brown, right? Like if you put something really dark behind it, it might look lighter than if you put something light behind it, like white behind that brown book. That might look darker in contrast to what is behind it. So there's an... There's something that the well, sensual eye is picking up that is judging the existence to be slightly, you know, the same or, or like slightly based on the context of the, the as you said, the the focus we have, how close we are, what are we looking at relative to 
versus the idea of brown as an idea which which subsumes all possible infinite sensual examples of brown things we could imagine there's still that idea of brown as that higher absolute idea right that's a good example kelly that's very good yeah or or yeah. like a fly you know yeah. how a, a fly a, the life of a fly could be like a day mm -hmm. and it it lives a whole lifetime where you know we're bigger and our lifetime i don't know if it feels it might feel the same as the fly but our lifetime is much greater in you know times around the sun <laughs> kind of thing how many yeah. revolutions around the sun that's more like long so, and short right like the the yeah. what is long for a fly might be short for us as far as the time time length is concerned but relative uh, to the fly it might yeah. be just as long to the fly like i'm just guessing yeah yeah but good other good example that's way. fine yeah, but there's still an idea. Like, of... Sorry, Quan. Yeah. And you, yeah, and when I you like... say Kelly, and when you say Kelly, that when you look closer, it would appear with more brown or with less brown and with gray or with red. Uh, there's a fancy word coming from Greek for that. And what is that fancy word? You know the word. I can't think of it. I don't know. Well, that's appearance. Okay, that appears brown, or that appears brown with red, or that appear brown with red and gray. So that three appearances, and those three appearances are phenomena. That's the fancy word in English that comes from Greek. And when we say the phenomenal word versus the word of idea, because Matt say idea, okay? So idea would get capital I, so that's the word of the timeless form versus the form, the word of the phenomena, that you excellent example of the brown, that could be brown or brown and red and brown and red and gray, okay? That's the appearances. So mm -hmm. that's the phenomenal word versus the timeless form. Yeah. The yeah. idea of brown precisely, okay? But because the idea of brown is at the, uh, is the intelligible reality, mm -hmm. okay? That's the timeless forms. Yeah. And the three, there are more than that, but you name three possible appearance dependent that you are closer or not close. Up, uh, totally brown, brown with gray, brown with gray and uh, red. Okay, those are the practical example you gave and those are perfect. Those are three appearances or three phenomenal appearances or three phenomenal existences with an S, okay? okay. So uh, why I interrupt you because... <laughs> Your example is just perfect from the central theme of Plato, the phenomenal world or the phenomenal dimension, also called becoming, also called time, versus the world of idea of the timeless form or the absolute world or the intelligible world. Okay, that's the absolute dance. And when I was given my speech on the aristocratic education, I said that it's an ironical lesson that is precisely the ironical lesson between the bio machine that would create that relative world of phenomena versus the awareness where is the world of the ideas precisely. That's good. Mm. Cool. All right. Glad we fleshed that out a little bit. So we got a, a working idea to build upon. Um, I'll start but, from that sentence again. Yeah, let's do that again. Okay, so, but you would agree, if I'm not mistaken, that existences are relative as well as absolute. Um, I lost my place here. You just say certainly. Uh, certainly. And the other is always relative to other. True. But this would not be the case unless being and the other entirely differed. For if the other, like being, were absolute as well as relative, then there would have been a kind of other which was not other than other. And now we find that, sorry, find that what is other must of necessity be what is in relation to some other. Uh, that is the true state of the case. Then we must admit the other as the fifth of our selected classes. Uh, yes. And the fifth class pervades all classes, for they differ from one another, not by reason of their own nature, but because they partake of the idea of the other. Uh, quite true. Right. 
then let us now put the case with reference to each of the five. Uh, how? First, there is motion, which we affirm to be absolutely other than rest. What else can we say? It is so. And therefore is not rest. Certainly not. And yet, because partaking of being. True. And again, motion is other than the same. Just so. And is therefore not the same. It is not. Yet surely motion is the same because all things partake of the same. Very true. Round and round we go. Mm -hmm. Then we must admit A, that motion is the same and is not the same, for we do not apply the terms same and not the same in the same sense. But we call it the same in relation to itself, because partaking of the same and not the same because having communion with the other, it is thereby severed from the same and has become not that but other and is therefore rightly spoken of as not the same. And just quick, sure. remember, keep in mind, because we're, we're, we stumbled upon as we we're pursuing the sophist, he's like, there's similarities to the philosopher, but the sophist seems to do this thing where they sound often quite similar, but will do something with the concept of not being that is a bit of a sleight of hand. And notice that just a little bit earlier, we we kind of allowed ourselves to agree that motion is other than rest. So we've chosen to define within our little logical construct so far, the concept of motion that we're pursuing as uh, that which is other than it rests, that which is the absence, the opposite than that which rests, right? So it's, it, all of a sudden motion has become a bit of a... Uh, a negation of of restfulness. It's not motion itself. It's an it's an absence of. So that's an un, an interesting thing he does occasionally, just to keep in mind. Is that right or wrong? I'm you know it's it's worth just always thinking uh, critically about every little step that we're we're being taken through. Uh, to be okay. sure. And if absolute motion in any point of view partook of rest, there would be no absurdity in calling motion stationary. Quite right. That is, on the supposition that some classes mingle with one another and others not. That such a communion of kinds is according to nature, we had already proved before we arrived at this part of our discussion. Uh, certainly. Let us proceed then. May we not say that motion is other than the other, having been also proved by us to be other than the same and other than rest. Uh, that is certain. Then according to this view, motion is other and also not other. True. What is the next step? Shall we say that motion is other than the three and not other than the fourth? For we agreed that there are five classes about and in the sphere of which we propose to make inquiry. Surely, surely we cannot admit that the number is less than it appeared to be just now. Then we may without fear contend that motion is other than being. Without the least, least fear. The plain result is that motion, since it partakes of being, really is and also is not. Nothing can be plainer. Then not being necessarily exists in the case of motion and of every class. For the nature of the other into them all makes each of them other than being and so non-existent. And therefore all of them, in like manner, we may truly say that they are not. And again, inasmuch as they partake of being, that they are and are existent. So we may assume... Every class, then, has plurality of being and infinity of not being. So we must infer. And being itself may be said to be other than the other kind. Certainly. Then we may infer that being is not, in respect of as many other things as there are. For not being there, sorry, not being these, it is itself one, and is not the other things which are infinite in number. That is not far from the truth. And we must not quarrel with this result, since it is the nature of classes to have communion with one another. And if any one denies our present statement, viz, that being not, etc., 
Let him first argue with our former conclusion, i.e., respecting the communion of ideas, and then he may proceed to others. Nothing can be fairer. Then let me ask you to consider a further question. What question? When we speak of not being, we speak, I suppose, not of something opposed to being, but only different. What do you mean? When we speak of something as not great, does the expression seem to you to imply what is little any more than what is equal? Certainly not. The negative particles, u and me, when prefixed to words, do not imply opposition, but only difference from the words or more correctly, from the things represented by the words which follow them. Quite true. There is another point to be considered if you do not object. But what is it? The nature of the other appears to me to be divided into fractions like knowledge. How so? Knowledge, like the other, is one, and yet the various parts of knowledge have each of them their own particular name, and hence there are many arts and kinds of knowledge. Quite true. And is not the case the same with the parts of the other, which is also one? Very likely, but will you tell me how? There is some part of the other which is opposed to the beautiful. There is? Shall we say that this has or has not a name? It has, for whatever we call not beautiful is other than beautiful, not than something else. And now tell me another thing. What? Is the not beautiful anything but this? An existence parted off from a certain kind of existence, and again from another point of view, of opposed to an existing something. True. Then the not beautiful turns out to be the opposition of being to being. A very true. This view is the beautiful a more real and the not beautiful a less real existence. Not at all. And the not great may be said to exist equally with the great. Yes. And in the same way, the just must be placed in the same category with the not just. The one cannot be said to have any more existence than the other. True. The same may be said of other things. Seeing that the nature of the other has a real existence, the parts of this nature must equally be supposed to exist. Of course. Then, as would appear... The opposition of a part of the other and a part of being to one another is, if I may venture to say so, as truly essence as being itself and implies not the opposite of being, but only what is other than being. Beyond question. What shall we call it? Clearly not being. And this is the very nature for which the sophist compelled us to search. And has not this, as you were saying, as real an existence as any other class? May I not say with confidence that not being has an assured existence and a nature of its own? Just as the great was found to be great and the beautiful beautiful and the not great not great and the not beautiful not beautiful, in the same manner, not being has been found to be and is not being and is to be reckoned one among the many classes of being. Do you, Theotetus, still feel any doubt of this? Uh, none whatever. So do you observe? Sorry, Matt. No. So maybe that, that would be a good point to just. I mean, Jumping, they, they, yeah. yeah, I mean, I. these are these are these are <laughs> really, really sophisticated lines here. Um, what do people think of this so far? That I not feel being inside out. Do we all agree that not being is? We can all get on board that not being has is is equal to being. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, there uh, are many there's, there, yeah, there's sure. a key there, there's a key word in nine letters. Mm -hmm. Key word in nine letters. Mm. Yes. Well, but Quan, do it in the form of like a question or something that's not like guess what I'm thinking. Like ask it in a. Yeah. It a, it a okay. question that frames it more yeah. for the mind. Yes, because here, okay, there's one thing that Paul read maybe five minutes ago, which is the core of the argumentation, okay? Being and non-being is not related by opposition, but, but what? 
by but what what is the word not related but opposition but by but different what? yes that's his 10 letters because uh, i'm uh, i wouldn't go bring back the nine letters word after uh. <laughs> okay so by difference exactly by difference of what um <laughs> If I have to give it a number, a difference of one. <laughs> okay. Okay. I would Not say a difference, I, a, a difference of essence, no? Yes, yes. That's what I want. But by one, I think that Kelly wanted to play. Uh, since I acknowledge that Kelly is a brilliant guy, I assume that he want to make a play of words between one and the money. And one and the money is another way to say essence and phenomena. Uh, yeah, or it doesn't even have to be many, but there's one and then... Was phenomenal the word you were looking for, Kwan? Uh, well, we, we, we are already at the center, okay? Yeah. We already identified that what, what, the, co the... Okay, go ahead. There is starting uh, that not being... Uh, yeah. I don't know if you can hear me well or not. Um. They're asserting that being and not being are, are, are have a sameness to them, but but in reality, the the appearance and being would be in an inverse relationship, of, and with the essence being and being. Yes. Or one. Yeah. Okay. The Greek word for being is ontos, and the Greek word on being is phenomenaia. Okay. What? Okay. Isness ontos means isness. Okay. That's being. And non-being is phenomena that which appear, okay? I would like to remind all you guys that the first half of the, the dialogue was about uh, ekistai and fantastikai, okay? Mm. The art of making sameness or the art of making appearance, okay? So, because it's related to what we are discussing here. So, we just have... Oh no. He'll come back. Had the, the being is related to non to non being by difference. Okay, so by difference. So rather than opposition. Ontos versus okay, ontos isness. Okay, now I I would say isness for being, and I would say appearance for non being. Okay, is it okay with you guys? Because it's closest to the Greek ontos and phenomenaia. So here. Plato said that uh, the, the relation between isness and appearance is not opposition, but difference. So what is make what what is the stuff that make that isness is different from appearances? It's Quan, a, a say that again one more time. I'm sorry. Plato said that isness is not in relation with appearance by the concept of opposition, but isness is related to appearances by the notion of difference. Difference of what? And Matt gave Matt gave the answer, <laughs> gentlemen. <laughs> I, I want to test your memory. <laughs> Matt gave the answer five minutes ago. The difference of being. Yes, I accept that because Matt say essence, but because yeah. essence would bring us to something closer. Okay. Okay. And that essence, what is that essence? Being. Yes, but when Kelly was give, what, what gave his example of the brown appearing as brown, as brown and gray, and brown, gray, wow. and red, I said wow. that there is two words. What is the word of phenomena, of appearances? And the other word, what is that, the other word? Ontos? No. Ontos is yeah. Uh, 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 yes, but there, there's another word. What is the other word? The word of idea. Yeah. Okay. Forms. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So here, he said that isness is in relation with appearance, 
in terms of difference of uh, essence uh, of uh, the absoluteness of the timeless forms. You lost me. Okay. In your example, what makes the difference between the three appearance of brown and, and the idea of brown? Uh, the appearance is because I looked at it more closely and I, I, know, I saw that it's made up of different parts. Your answer is right on the operational level, but I repeat my question. In your, you, on the phenomenal reality, there were three appearances of brown. And on the idea level, there is the idea of brownness. Okay? So here, Plato say that the three appearance of brown is not related to the idea of brownness in terms of opposition, but in terms of difference. Okay, what is the difference between and, the idea of brownness and the three appearances of brown? Difference of quality. The yes. Essence. Yes, difference of quality. The, the can you be more precise? Oh, okay. Like, um, I, don't, I think it'll, like it's a different harmonic, a different scale. Different scale, different harmonics, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, because we are all give, we all gave now different words for the fact of the word of ideas, which is different from the word of appearance. Okay, that is the difference. Yeah, sure. Okay, there is a difference, and that difference is that- when, on... when... Oh, Nathan, man, your, your, your mic is so bad, dude. Uh, Nathan, maybe you should deactivate your camera so your sound would be better. Or yeah, you can deactivate the question. camera, and then if that still doesn't work, then just write down your thoughts in the chat box. Okay, and um, just, just for me. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. So, so here, the, the core concept is really there is a difference between the word of idea and the word of of appearance, okay? And uh, I think that the, the example that, uh, and the the, the, line, the nine letter letters word that I was looking for, and, and the word was in the dialogue, the sophist that poem just read, uh, is the existence, okay? Being and non-being, they both exist. Because there is some isness in them, both of them have some isness, but they are different in their isness. And that difference is that in the world of appearance, you can have a multiplicity of appearance, but in the world of idea, you have one idea of brownness. And I, get, I take again your example, Kelly, because it's an excellent example. In the world of idea, there is only one idea of brownness, but you gave three different appearances of brown. It could be a million appearances of brown, okay? We limit ourselves to three here, but one and the money, being and becoming, okay? Once again, or the world of idea, one, or the world of phenomena, many appearances. The only question I would have here, though, would he include something like um, death as being something that has an equal state to existence as, let's say, life? Or would he see the death as being an absence of life uh, in its essence of being? How would how would we follow that uh, treatment according to this logic here that we've just been following? Uh, I would say, can we make a relation of difference between life and death? Once again, the difference between ontos and phenomenaya is that there is a difference. Uh, is life and death different? Yes. It depends if we're talking about like the death of the body, but we, um, if we assume that a soul lives on, then does that really die? Okay, but once again, uh, death, is it something that happens in time or in timelessness? In sure. time, in time. Sure. Okay. So there is a difference. And life, is it something that happened in times or in timelessness? Both. 
exactly in both. Yeah. So is it true that there is a difference between life and death? Because in one case, life is happening in time, in timelessness. And in the other case, death is only happening in time. So there is a difference between the two. Oh, yeah. Uh, Quan, when you say timelessness, uh, do you mean like basically going on forever? Timelessness means out of time. Okay. Yeah. So when I, uh, no, when I think of, yes, time, uh, look, there's a very simple way to make the distinction. Time is growth and death. Right. Timelessness is outside of time. So it's something that doesn't, ha it's never born and never die. That's timelessness. Yeah, but life uh, is consists of uh, birth, growth, and death. Within in time. With, in, time, in, time, yeah. time in time, yeah. yeah. You, said, they, you said life was in timelessness. Both. Yes, but no. both. In because both. life... Life also is the the infinite awareness that is always never born and never die. So life has a timeless dimension, reality, and a time dimension. And death happens only in time. Well, I'm lost. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, for death, it's easy. For life, in time, it's easy too, because there is birth. Sure, sure. But... but uh, uh, the universe has always been there. It was never born and it's ne it will never die. Okay, that's timelessness. Yeah. Is well, that yeah, a we... physical thing? Timelessness? Excuse me? Is it physical? A timelessness uh, is not physical. Yeah, timelessness not physical, is the yeah. source. Yeah. Is a, timelessness is the source of time. The, the physical stuff uh, like us, or like the objects, are in time. They are not in timelessness because everything that is physical would be born or would be made one day. For example, a chair is made one day. So it's a kind of birth for the chair. The chair wouldn't exist for a certain time. Even if we take care of the chair, we know that chair would be broken one day, even if it would take five centuries. So there is a birth, a, a growth, and a death for a chair, like for a human being. Okay, but you, you're talking about the, the life of the universe being infinite or uh, timeless, isn't it? That that may be the case, but when you take let's say the life of a porcupine, okay, it 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 doesn't uh, extend indefinitely. So I exactly. don't understand how, that's, how that also participates in timelessness. Uh, because that you have uh, um, uh, instances of life that is in time, so that uh -huh. part will die. But you have the absolute life which is not in time, which is timeless, and in that case. Uh, th there's stuff that will never die. Well, when you're using the word life here, how does it? How is it distinguished from being? The concept, uh, the concept of time. Okay, is because be okay, being is isness. Okay, being yeah. is simply the fact isness. Yeah. Uh, life uh, can be simply isness, but life can so also be some uh, particular. Examples, for example, my life, your life, the life of uh, someone else. Okay, the okay, life so of how, the sun. So, how can life be isness? That's where I don't get. Okay, because life is also the dimension of eternity, of infinity. You have uh, awareness in us, in uh, a particular human being or in a particular animal, but you can also have that awareness that is infinite. And that is. Would you, never... would you, are you saying that the idea of life is timeless rather than life itself? Uh, the the idea, all but also the infinite awareness. Okay, but if it's easier for you to understand that the idea of life is timeless, maybe it's the best way to explain it to you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Like, yeah, the, like, like, like the concept like the, of love is timeless. Like exactly. Uh, or like the idea of brown, Kelly. Your, your example was excellent, okay? <laughs> the idea of brown is timeless, okay? But specific brown that you see now today and tomorrow you will come back to the same place and you look at it again. It'll be different, yeah. You would have another appearance, okay? So that mm -hmm. idea of brown is timeless, but the, uh, the experience of uh, the brown in time, when the different at each time that you can look at the place. Yeah, I, I was I, I worked on uh, hardwood floors. I would stain floors. There's tons of shades of brown. 
Yeah. And I'd have to match it exactly to what the customer wanted. You you match the color, you come back the next day or in the sunlight. It, just like you said, it would be, a, it's like a totally different thing. So the final color, it would, I'd have to have a, something in my head. I'd have to come up with um, this combination color. So when the customer would li would live on in this floor, they would see, uh, like I had to think like they thought, and it would it would be an average of what the actual color was. It's really yeah. strange. Uh, to to answer to Nathan's question that he put in the chat, uh, my answer is read uh, very seriously chapter seven of the Republic. Good. Yeah. No, I, I'm I'm glad we had this little segue because it's really important to, and it, it it's not immediately self evident. It has to really be, be pondered, but then it becomes something you can really work with. Um, the 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 two domains of existence, as far as the the becoming domain of change that our senses are located in, right? That we're we're using to map and to to triangulate it onto the higher domain of of uh, that which is eternal and non changing. And how they relate, it's 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 there's a there's a built-in irony, right? That we that we should really cherish. It's 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 an important irony that that this higher realm of the divine of 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 eternity of of uh, perfection, right? Uh, which it, <laughs> like the the square that transcends all drawable squares, right? Every square you could draw is oh is not going can always be made more perfect. That's a that's a big statement, right? To, that every square, no square can be physically drawn. That a, a more perfect square could not be done, no matter how good technology ever gets in the physical universe. But yet we could still have an idea of the perfect square, the perfect triangle, the perfect you know, the, the, these these ideas are so important, and it gives us like the perfect justice, right? When we when we transcend to working on higher ideas within the tapestry of creation, it becomes even more rich. And you have to have like some some scaffolding to build upon that that you that you really uh, built up well that can because because a lot of people they want to straight go straight It'll into never the be test of time yeah. yeah they want to go straight into philo philosophizing well, about justice and having opinions about these big things without having first like worked on as Quan says the the ten gardens like really just put put oneself through building up the faculties of the things we can know and, and slowly then tackle as Plato himself said. Let no one enter this academy who hasn't mastered geometry. So why did he say that? Because he knows that people will make a mess <laughs> if they go straight into broad metaphysics without first building in their skill sets. So it's great that we just did this and we're developing that skill set for judging the two different realities, the relative and the absolute, and how they how they play into each other in a in a fun way. So it's good. Question: uh, Do we want to push on? Further, because we could feasibly read twenty pages tonight, or we could just continue dis like philosophical discourse and close it up and just finish it next week. What, what do people want to do? Happy to go either way. I like taking notes. <laughs> yeah, but I, I would say that uh, if I may, uh, we are at the core of very complex ideas. I suggest that we discuss deeper those ideas. Okay. Sure. All right. I thought so too. I was feeling that as well. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of hooked on like, like even things that are the same, they're different. And it's almost like I want to say that everything, everything in this world is different, even if it appears the same. Yeah, it gets us away from a binary logic of opposition. Exact, exact. That is a big thing too. Yeah, okay? yeah. Because, uh, and I think that Plato here gave a, a incredible lesson with many uh, consequences and uh, on the political level also, okay? If you, in life, you see things as not opposite stuff, but rather things with differences, it gives a completely different mindset and it gives people much more nuance and capacity to discuss with others having different ideas precisely. 
But question here, Quan, what about when you enter the domain of intentions that then bring us into lies and truth uh, and intentions to deceive or to uh, pursue? Because I agree with you with if, if somebody has a good heart, good will, and is just simply of a different opinion, it's good to have two people of good will, uh, have tolerance, have dialogue, discourse. Because it's just different, even if one is like partic partaking more in being factually correct than the other, it doesn't matter because the heart is right. So it's OK. But then what about when you have the intention factor introduced now? How does, does that still is that an equi equivocal? Can we extend that into that domain or then do we have like because I think of a lie as being very not just different from truth, but like um, more antagonistic to truth if it's intentional. Okay. I would say that here the garden of the muses would be useful for my answer. Mm. I have the pretension to say that people at 3.0 are different from people at 3.5 and different from people at 3.10. Okay, I remind that 3.10 is when you are truly in the last garden, that you truly have uh, the last form of beauty, meaning justice. Okay, because once again, Morality and justice cannot be preached, okay? You have to travel your epistemological journey till your level of awareness is crystallized enough that you will never do something that is ugly, okay? That's because that is true morality. When you reach to that um, crystallization of your awareness that you will have a physical revulsion if you do something ugly, okay? That is... And to, uh, I did not uh, forget your question, Matt. The difference of opinion here, the nuance that you have to bring is that different to what extent, okay? In the sense that the, the people having different opinion, it's still opinion, okay? So meaning that as long as you are not in the 10 garden of the muses, you can have opinions, but you don't truly have... Uh, ideas, you don't truly have uh, awareness, you don't truly have uh, a beginning of episteme. So in that sense, it is inevitable that people who are, did not reach a 3.10 would fight among themselves uh, and not being very productive for the common good because uh, the answer is that they have to work first on their capacity of awareness. They have first to reach 3.10 as a concentration of awareness, even if I'm perfectly aware that this expression is clumsy, before being really capable to contribute to the common good. Before that, uh, going into the public scene, is you would be more a nuisance than anything else. So are you so saying- what the sophists are. Are you saying if, yes. what, if you get into like the higher state, that you your tendency to say lie wouldn't be as strong like i guess my question is why why would people lie okay people was... people lie because they want to get some stuff okay that's one possible reason people lie because they want to appear knowledgeable and they don't have the knowledge but they want to appear knowledgeable that's the surface uh, people lie because uh, they are fearful okay so those are probably the first three reasons why people lie. They, they, they fear something. They want to appear more than they are. They don't really know, but they want to appear to know. So, but the true reason be, 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 behind those three sub reasons is that they did not have a, a high enough epistemological level. I have here a standpoint, a pattern, Point that would probably be labeled as a tyrannical. I think that people that, who did not achieve their, fir their first station of the divine kingdom, of uh, the, 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 the world of idea, okay, justice, what I call the level 3.10, should not be involved in politics. But I am perfectly aware that my position would be labeled as a tyrannical and uh, uh, dictatorial. But that's the platonic standpoint. That's my standpoint. 
I guess the problem that I encounter is that the fact is we do live in a world shaped by, um, I guess in, in your ter the terminology of the the layer the levels of of development, um, an oligarchical uh, principle or, or a force of culture shaped by the the level three, um, you know, tyrannical class yeah. types. Who are very sophisticated, uh, 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 very hey. vicious, and very good at uh, deceit for the sake of destroying and undermining truth, because there's this whole, you know, whatever. I mean, we, self, we 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 all have a sense of like, what? Self preservation. No, I yeah, it's that's just what, that. It's an element yeah. of it, but I wouldn't I wouldn't reduce it simply just to that. There's more to it. Yeah. Um. There's like a, a, I I I do think that there's like this positive ritualistic religious sort of mythology that is animating this op this thing that we're that we're talking about um so when i'm dealing with because you know in like in our line of work we're always like looking at um the the lies that have been cooked up to be sacred truths masquerading as truth but just in order to keep us so, like you know enslaved and shackled mentally and, and spiritually in a box visit yeah. Um, but Matt, you know, you know that one of the the job of the sophists on the political realm, you know, is to make the unjust appear just, right? Right, right. Oh, sure, yeah. okay. absolutely. Okay. So, yeah. well, why uh, would they do that? The, yes. Okay. Uh, go ahead. How they do? I want to know. <laughs> because they're manipulators. <laughs> because well, Kelly, it can be it can be answered in two words. Okay. Mm -hmm. Spinning mythology, as Matt said, spinning mm -hmm. mythology. Okay, I, you know, my, are... my point though is, I just have a difficult time just simply allowing that it's just simply different uh, than the truth. You know, like I, I find it that category of intention to deceive by creating these constructs is. I don't like just saying it's different. There's something lacking. I find in that if there's intention there and all. Yeah, that. but. Yes, but different from the truth. Okay, what is truth? Truth is to be. Truth is the highest form. Okay, so truth is characterized also by goodness and by beauty. Okay, because no. when you say truth, it includes goodness and beauty. When you say beauty, it's only beauty. When you say goodness, it includes beauty. Okay, and but but when it's truly whole. You say beauty, it includes goodness and truth. You say truth, it includes goodness and beauty. You say goodness, it includes beauty and, and truth. Mm -hmm. So when you say it's different from truth, you mean it's different from goodness and beauty. I have no problem to understand that, pe that stuff of, of people that are different from truth. But of course that they would spin uh, mythology and they would try to... Uh, maintain the position and of course that they would make the unjust appear just because they are different precisely from truth, goodness and beauty. I wonder if uh, if it might help uh, to think about equating the term um, mythology with narrative because that's what we're more familiar with I think in the political realm. Yeah, I agree. And narrative is clearer when we speak yeah. about politics. Oh, is it I, a theory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I absolutely agree with your nuance. Question: okay. Isn't he saying here though that uh, in this view that we're entertaining right now, that beautiful is more real and the not beautiful less real, uh, a less real existence? So these are both existences. Uh, and then he says, "But not at all." But which is different? What are different? Okay, that is the core. That is a core conclusion. Fifteen minutes of reading. They both yeah. exist, but they are different. That is the key word and not opposite. I would like to remind you uh, a stuff that I gave uh, when I was giving my stuff, uh, my, my stuff, my lecture on the aristocratic education. Okay. Uh, I said that at the third layer of mind development, meaning the layer of the surface precisely or of the social sophistication of the, of the psyche, there is a drop of awareness. Okay. I said that the biomachine is not prim primarily characterized by awareness, but the biomachine is not completely devoid of awareness. And that the word that characterizes the best and is a Greek word for that layer of the mind 
and I, maybe I would even remove psyche to put that Greek word that I love more and more, is metis, M-E-T-I-S, okay, meaning the intelligence of being cunning. Mm -hmm. So it's a form of awareness, but it's a low form of awareness. It's a low form of awareness because the sophist is capable to read the mind of the others. And not everyone is capable to read the mind of the other, okay? The people at the first layer of mind development, which is the sense perception, and at the second layer, the intellectual that I call the nerds, they are very clumsy socially. They are not capable of metis. That small drop of awareness means that there is awareness in the animal kingdom uh, uh, in the first three lines of mind development. So it is not opposite in nature with the higher kingdom of idea or awareness, but there is a difference of intensity of awareness. What's the word again? Like volume. Uh, the Greek, uh, if you're speaking Meti? of the Greek word, yes. metis, metis, M-I-M-E-T-I-S, metis. You were speaking uh, of truth, goodness, and beauty, uh, Matt, where, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to maybe like chaos, like we live in this world where I don't know, things can go like just crazy. And so we hold on to this thing called goodness, truth, and beauty. Is it, um, I just had a thought where is could we equate good, goodness, truth, and beauty to being more harmonically proportioned in how the universe works? Mm. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, what did you think? Um, just, I don't know, more like how, how existence is constructed. <laughs> yeah, it's a possible direction of motion. I, I would I say... Mean, uh, harmonics yeah. is what I'm referencing there, Kelly. Oh. Yeah, like, oh. har like when we hear music, we, you know, like a nice look, song. Look, look, you, you can equate... You more can get... harmonically proportioned, like, yeah. is this how the universe actually works? You know, uh, when the look, planets, um, the stars. We might be able to go a whole lot of steps further. I mean, if you take the way in which the human mind works or the, the brain works or whatever and go down to uh, um, <clears throat> DNA, it's a vibrating frequency. It's both an antenna, a receiver, and it also projects. It interacts with the world around it, et cetera, et cetera, on a, uh, on a harmonic level, if you like. So, I mean, take that a whole lot of steps further. Let, let's scale that one up to the level of, humanity thinking as one i mean even in the chaos that we have at the moment you can kind of get a sense or i do anyway that there's, there's kind of a feeling to it you know it feels bad the last three or four years but finally at the moment it's starting to feel like it's tipping over you know there's, there's a collective feeling a, 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 an interaction of um let's say potential harmonics at work there if i could comment very quickly on what the previous speaker said uh where you were trying to reach at the last thing you said there, think about this uh, this part of the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven, and consider that in terms of what you're thinking about. Yeah. Perhaps. I'm reminded of uh, John Keats's poem, An Erd to a Grecian Urn, where he states, beauty is truth, truth is beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. And I'm thinking this in terms of this idea of the pursuit of happiness or the idea of becoming a more perfect union of this being and becoming. So innately, I think within us and the time realm and the timeless realm, we have an innate sense of what is beauty. And we can always measure that, I think, in so far as philosophically or scientifically or how you look at it. I think we have an innate knowing which we can build, for, build from. Uh, so I'm, I'm still struggling with this idea of whether beauty is in the timeless realm and truth is in the timeless realm. I think they, in some sense, are in both. But uh, uh, that quote, John Keats, I think, is... Uh, 
has some application here. Yeah. But uh, Monty, you're right. They are they are in both. Yeah. Uh, the idea is in the timeless reality, but in time you have uh, appearances of beauty. You have appearances of goodness. You have appearances of truth. Yeah, I might but be jumping in here. Uh, I'm not a big Plato guy, and, mm -hmm. and I'm this is part four, and I'm just showing up now. So everybody, just tell me if I'm being a dork here. But for me, and even my takeaway from this reading tonight, it, what obligation does truth have to us to be beautiful? I don't see the connection. The truth is the truth. It seems to me to be a construction to make it beautiful. The truth can be yeah. ugly. Uh, yeah. Am I, am I missing the point? Tell me if I'm missing the no, point. No, it's a, no, it's a a great, no, that's a wonderful, no. dude, dude, that's a wonderful point. No, it is a really nice point. Like, you know, there's a bunch of dead bodies in the basement, you know, like I'd rather not know, but somebody just told me and now it's the, it's factually true and really disturbing because how that happened. <laughs> Um, good it might be overly literal or legal no, or whatever. For me, the truth is fact based. Yeah, and it yeah. doesn't. I'll just it's try, beautiful. Uh, it, people I'll just will tend to say it's beautiful if it serves their purpose, but it doesn't need to be beautiful yeah. to me. It just needs to. I need to know that it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whether I like it or not. I guess yeah. my purpose in all this is to see humanity or uh, actually even the universe to flourish whatever that means yeah but, but my takeaway even from the the bits we were reading is that seemed to be kind of where he was going with it like not yeah. being is also being and 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 he's trying to like i think the important take i think the important takeaway from this guy I think the yeah. important takeaway though was the the idea that uh you know i mean the two of them not being being representative of a polarity and most times we interpret that polarity as being an in opposition. And I think the major takeaway, at least for me today, is the idea that, no, it's not an opposition, it's a difference. Yeah. It, yes. can, include, it, can, it can include a range of things. So all of a sudden, as I said, you're not stuck in a binary logic. It's yeah. broader than that. It's a more open system of organisation, which is the way I view the universe. I mean, and, and again, I'll, I'll go back to one more thing, that idea of truth, beauty, you know, ugly or whatever. I think in some ways, even when you're thinking of truth as a form, you know, a, a platonic Socratic form, that there is a, 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 I'm not with you at all here, uh, um, the idea that it's something that we we give a quality to it, that, that, that we describe as, you know, using the word beauty, that um, that is just simply meant to be part of that overarching form. You know, what kind of a reality does it have? Well, it has many, many expressions. It's like as soon as you come down from any form idea, there are many appearances of that form in the phenomenal world, for example. Exactly. But to me, I, 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 I can easily equate the idea of, of, of truth as we're understanding it philosophically here, Confucian, Platonic, whatever, as having a quality of beauty and um, accepting either that that is a universal truth that we observe or that it is the quality that we give to the form that lifts truth into a, I don't know, you know, an area of its own, or it's another aspect of truth, if you like. I'm happy to go with either. But, you know, I mean, that doesn't blind me to the reality of of, of, of things around us too. And I accept that, that it's far, far greater to accept the reality of what we observe rather than trying to sugarcoat it. But, yeah, if, but if we're but, studying sophism here, isn't it, uh, let me ask the question then. Yeah. When you consider truth and falsity, are they different or are they opposed? What would you say? Okay, first, um, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead, go, go ahead, Paul. Okay. No, no, go, yeah, you're better off at answering that one. Uh, well, I would say that first I want, okay, Matt, do you have something to say first? No, no, I just want to, to emphasize that, yeah, that, that was not at all resolved. And I do share that same yeah. question too, that's still li yeah. lingering as yeah. well. I, <laughs> Yeah. But go ahead, Quan. I, I I'd like to get your take on uh, on that again, even though you've already addressed it in your own way. Oh no, but absolutely, because we are at the center of the axial epistemological yeah. <laughs> triangle, three sides. Okay, and the three words that have been used: facts, truth, 
and narrative or myth, okay? Because mm -hmm. uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use narrative uh, to follow Ken's suggestion because to stay in the political uh, reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you say, for example, that uh, we see that there are 10 uh, dead people in the basement, okay, that's a fact. That's a fact. That what is the fact if you see 10 people, dead people in the basement, means that your sense perception and your intellect and your emotional intelligence gave you that data, okay? That fact comes from the fact that you are capable to observe that there are 10 corpses in the basement and you intellect can make you understand that those bodies are no longer living, okay? That's a fact. That's a data coming from your bio machine. Uh, do, 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 do we agree on that? Okay. Sure. And that you discover those 10 bodies, dead bodies uh, on the uh, February 20, uh, 2024, for example. Okay. That's a fact, meaning that those are data coming from the time perception of your bio machine. Truth is an idea in the domain of timelessness, meaning that truth something that is coming from a data given by your bio machine. Truth is an archetype in the construction of the whole reality. If I ask you to give a short definition of truth, what would you say, Jason? Well, didn't we, sorry, didn't we say it was both in the, the, the material as well? No, in the material world, we are speaking of facts. Okay, facts are stuff that can be measured, that can be, that are data of our sense of perception coming from our bio machine. And when I say bio machine, it's not only sense perception, it's the intellect, wording, conceptualizing, and the emotional intelligence. Okay, so please understand me that when I say bio machine, it's the three layers. Okay, so facts are data coming from our bio machine. Mm -hmm. And I don't. I did not re, uh, forget my question to Jason. So, in uh, facts, how did you facts is what I brought up before. That's generally where I land the truth from objective okay. reality. So, okay. So, uh, facts is not truth. Uh, facts is uh, truth is ontos is being is isness. Okay. Facts are data coming from your bio machine. Uh, I just want to push a little bit further. Can you say, can you, can you give me a short definition of truth? I would say it relates to our cognitive ability to understand the proof of principle of a universal principle. In other words, our yes, conviction of that, our idea of a universal principle as it applies to this reality. Truth is inarguable. Yeah. Inarguable. Can, what, did you say, what did you mean by that? It cannot be translated into words and concepts? If something is true, you can't deny it. If something is true, you can't argue against it. Yeah, but, if, if something, but if something is factual, you cannot deny it either. Right. That's why I kind of equate the two. That's where truth, truth is, springs from facts for me. Okay. Uh, facts, once again, uh, is about the bio machine it's not about the timeless reality uh because uh, let me think uh, <laughs> uh, for example for example you cannot see you cannot see the fringe of the universe okay uh, according to our uh, science nowadays uh, the observable universe i think is about 94 uh, mm. Mm -hmm. 94,000 um, uh, light years or something like that. I might be mistaken in the number, but there's I think, a, it, I so, think it, a lot bigger than that, Juan. Yeah, uh, there is a certain number of light years Big. that define the diameter of the observable universe, okay? Yeah. But you cannot see beyond that, okay? Yeah. But you have the idea that mm -hmm. there is something that is beyond that observable sphere of the observable universe. Okay, and here we are in the domain that the, the machine cannot give us 
a direct perception, but it's rather from the timeless reality of truth that we get that idea, that form, that timeless form. Because idea is a Greek word. Well, that's an English word coming from the Greek word eidos, meaning form. But here we have to understand timeless form, meaning that something that is not given to you through the three layers of your bio machine. Okay. And there's Sense no way perception. we can really understand it either, because we're we're only human. Uh, we under uh, we understand it with a certain difficulty. Let's say. Yeah. We can only go so far. Yeah. So then, yeah, in, so in in that example, uh, let let me further my my side of this is that I've never and still don't accept it as truth that the universe is eighty seven billion light years across, and that there's something or there's nothing at uh, outside the barrier of that. I don't accept that as truth. It's, it's, you can't, it's completely arguable all day, exactly. all night. Uh, all sorts of people can get together and argue about exactly how big the universe is, exactly how old it is, where the frontier is, what's beyond that, what started it. And we're arguing about it every day. You can just go on YouTube. So none of that is truth to me. In so any way, you're, shape, or form. It's not you're, an you're, no, fact. You're, you're absolutely right because the truth is not there. The, the I forget truth, the author's the, name. The, I the, the truth is not the fact that the universe uh, has a limit or infinite or, or finite. The truth is in the fact that you have those ideas in your mind. Okay, that's the truth. Okay, uh, once again, okay, there is a domain of timeless form that make your mind think about those, categ those mental categories. Mm -hmm. And the truth is not the answer that the universe is infinite or not infinite. The truth is that you have that kind of timeless forms in your superior mind that trigger you to enter into that kind of debate. Could you say the truth is that you know that you don't know? Is that a truth? Or a fact. That's one. That's one of the timeless form of the superior mind. Okay, I'm a big that's, fan of that truth. That that's that's yeah. a guiding truth okay. for me. Yeah. Well, that's that's an excellent example of a timeless form of your mind that is not given to you by the three layers of your mechanical mind. So I get it. I get it. And, and so now we're breaking it down. And I definitely don't think that you know like existence and truth and such are, are, are just like a series of facts, a bunch of pebbles on the road that you can point to. It's, it's not that simple. Now we're yeah. breaking it down. I see what you're saying. Truth is truth is a layer that gets imposed by by human existence, by by our existence. I mean, we need to say something's true. Something just can't be true. I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting that. Yeah. It's just that I, I personally heavily rely on evidence and fact on facts for, on facts for what but, I say is true, but I do have to say it. Or I, I, I suggest that we make that you make an exercise each time that you want to say it is true. Is it possible to say it is factual? Right, right. Is it a measurable I, truth? I think there's a yeah. distinction that can be made uh, just like, for instance, in understanding the Pythagorean theorem. Mathematically, a squared, b squared plus c squared, I mean, it seems to work in some circumstances, but that's not really a proof that, you know, it's just factual. But the, yes. the presentation of the actual doubling of the square through the diagonal is a concept, even though there's not a perfect square like Matt referred to, I mean, we can have the idea of a perfect square and a diagonal. And so I think there is proofs of principle that are not just factual, but we can basically know and understand about the universe. Yes, we can build, we live we can build in, the entirety of our science upon such things. There you go. Exactly. I was just going to say the modern yeah. science is entirely, it's being transformed into a religion where we're being told that the truth from these mathematical exercises yeah, that's that work that work we can build an atom bomb but they they aren't necessarily themselves 
un, inarguably factual. It's just that they they're, weren't. They're all modern. based on. They're all based on. You know, like every model, they're based on certain assumptions. Simple so as that. You start questioning those assumptions, and many of the models simply fall down. Well, you're yeah. describing. So I mean, it, it it works though. So they they use the fact that it works as the idea yeah. that this is the absolute God given truth. Yeah, but uh, we can, even though it's we just can math. control it. So, so this is very interesting, Quan. This brings it right around full circle in that people could claim that they have control of the facts because look, I can build an atom bomb. Yeah, but, but what you're what you're describing well, an well, entirely let, let, different Ken, 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 interpretation Ken, 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 let's, let's could work as well. Yeah. yeah, one at a time. No, I liked I liked what Jason said, I, and Ken, you should you should speak. I I just didn't I wanted Jason to finish his thought because it's an it's a good irony, right? That that we can build the yeah, atom bomb. I like that, but we don't have the, but the, they have the facts, the, the, but not necessarily the understanding of what exactly it is, the substance that we it might not up. be the truth. Yeah, the problem you know? is that, he, that what he the, the, what it's he's certainly speaking. been questioned many times. Can I speak? It, can I yes. Speak for a second? Yeah, Ken. Thank you. It's been questioned on many yeah. levels. Okay, sir. Hello. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what sort so of energies are we actually? Paul, gaining Paul, every time Paul, are you trying to cut Holy Ken off? Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, so uh, the, the problem that I'm having with what he's saying is that he's conflating science with scientism. Okay, or si sorry, yeah, science with with scientism. Okay, it's not science that is going in a certain direction. It's that people are uh, actually express are actually. Uh, producing scientism which is which is not the same thing as science at all in the first place but the fact that people are capable to make atomic bombs means that they understand to a certain extent the reality of the material dimension since they are capable to make a stuff that would explode with a certain power okay sure but he was talking earlier about uh, people who speak from science with authority rather, you know, dogmatically rather than uh, through, you yes. know, the scientific method. And that's, uh, that's scientism. It's not science. Absolutely. Meaning that the people capable to make an atomic bomb would not be necessarily the same people that would be capable to create uh, the science that would bring to that technological capacity. That's for sure. Okay, for example, we I, okay that's a small example, but apparently, uh, the UK managed to fail a time to launch uh, a uh, an atomic missile from their submarine. Okay, so uh, maybe they were scientists that developed enough to understand the ballistics in the past from a submarines. but apparently this week they were not capable to do it. Uh, two consecutive times. So maybe they lost the true understanding of uh, ballistics from a submarine. Uh, so uh, you can have people at the beginning having the true understanding, but that true understanding might not be transmitted 100% to the second, to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth generations. Mm -hmm. So the epistemological development is something that has to be renewed at each gen generation so that we are not simply technicians manipulating stuff at the level of facts, but we can also go to the heuristics and the theoria level of the timeless form in order to renew that creativity and this discovery. I love that point that we need to renew. The, the reason that, um, and I can speak from personal 100% experience, the reason that Flat Earth took off is because we stopped renewing the knowledge that we had gained about um, the, sh the shape of the earth and the physics of the earth. We had stopped transmitting that in school. We just sat kids down with a globe at the front of the desk and said, that's the earth. Mm -hmm. And then I saw in real time the flatter um, kind of revolution happening on YouTube. And I got hit with all these videos right away. And there were some of the most successful ones were like, you know, 50 reasons why. And he'd, he'd say 50 things and 48 of them I had no answer for. And I probably spent about two weeks in about 2016 <laughs> where I was like, 
maybe maybe it's flat, man. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, got me dude. going too. And, I, and I, I'm searching around, and I couldn't find answers to anything that these people were proposing. But I could find videos of people making fun of them and being complete assholes to them, just like with you know anti-vaxxers and anti-science and all this stuff. And it took a good year, two years until a healthy um, series of, of people started showing up with documentation to explain why this is the way it is to counter mm. the arguments. The, for mm -hmm. the first year, they just laughed at these uh, heretics who dared to, 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 yeah. to say something different, right? And we all know how that feels from our experience over the last few years or mm -hmm. decades, depending how long we've been on our kind of contrarian paths. So I think that point, Quan, is amazing. We need to renew. Like mm -hmm. we need to, do, just showing up for this tonight and, and seeing a, an ancient text like this and being, getting my mind jostled out of just day-to-day -day existence and renewing some some thoughts. This is worth a lot. And, uh, can I, can I say something very quickly on that? Go uh, just, ahead. Yeah, just the... Um, it, just to back up and, and maybe amplify a little bit what you're saying that touches also on this question of like real understanding versus like simple opinion. When we sit the kids in front of the classroom, when we show them diagrams and, and show them the globe and tell them, you know, all of these facts, they can memorize the facts. They can maybe have opinions. Maybe these opinions are right. If they go out and, you know, graduate and get a job, maybe they'll be an engineer and they'll use these opinions and uh, put out a satellite for uh, some rocket company or something, you know, like they'll get effects with all the stuff they memorized, but they won't have like the deep, the deep knowledge of what they're manipulating. And they will be very susceptible to an argument coming to their, their, their world. Like we've seen with the flat earth taking off thing, right? There's so many, so many arguments that can be presented that then bust, that bust their entire worldview um, because they didn't ever have, it was never a discovery. Whereas like, if you look a few generations yeah. back, it was more common for students to rediscover the proof that Eratosthenes had set up in Alexandria right. to right. demonstrate the differential of this, the size of shadows along a meridian line from two cities right. separated by like whatever, 200 miles or something or less. Right. And just by like at the same time of, of day, taking note of the differential of the shadows of a stick of the same length, you would be able to sit down and extrapolate what must be the contour of the the surface area, the surface that such differential shadows are 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 falling upon and then you could calculate like Eratosthenes did, did um a relatively solid uh, uh you know outcome of of the circumference of the earth and he was so close like 50 kilometers or uh, he was like 50... like like three percent off or something like that yeah like yeah. so and, and he had to like get his servant to go to like the other city and they yeah. had to use sundials or whatever but anybody no internet, today no today it's so much easier right like now with cell phone technology we could replicate that as students seven eight years old so much more easily by just calling our, our buddy up from another school you know in new york from montreal and just taking the measurement no, none of the compl complexity that Eratosthenes and his servant had to deal with, and 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 that that experience in one day would ground it for life, and they'd be Im immune from all sorts of yeah. false right. you know right. arguments that would throw them off off course. So. Yes, and I I want to complete my uh, axial epistemopolitical triangle. We were speaking of uh, the difference between facts and truth. The last term is myth or narratives. So we make the difference very clearly that facts is coming from three layers of the bio machine and truth is more rather from the timeless form uh, of the ideas, okay? So what would be the difference between truth and myth and the difference between myth and facts or narratives to follow Ken's advice? Yeah, that's okay. So I had like a really quick answer in that, you know, myths are, are, um, you know, almost like stories, right? So they can't be truths, but myths last because they convey truth. So that's not an easy answer. In many cases, they are re regarded as histories yes, rather than. But if, if we if we convert this to narratives, some narratives last that are not true. Okay, mm -hmm. let's be clear about that. 
Okay. I I would I would throw in my th my hypothesis that one one relates to uh um realities that deal with the body and the senses, the other of realities that deal with the mind and understanding and the other that deals with uh the soul. Um very interesting. And... I'd like to go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Please. Okay, I'd like to suggest uh, that it has something to do, the truth has something to do with conveyance. So, um, yeah, I, you know, there it is possible to deceive oneself as to what one's senses are perceiving. And, you know, when it gets to a certain level, we tend to call that mental illness. But um, generally speaking, uh, it's a question of what you are conveying to others about what your senses have perceived or, you know, using, using, um, uh, Kwan's, uh, three levels of, uh, the mechanical, um, uh, uh, being or the mechanical mind, I'm sorry, uh, perceiving what's in, what, what is there to be perceived. And when you convey it on a Lloyd, then you are telling the truth. But when you, uh, if uh, if uh, Matt said, well, there's only actually there aren't any bodies in the basement, officer. Um, I was uh, that was a false report that somebody gave you. Okay, that is uh, m misrepresenting what he knows to be uh, factually perceivable. Interesting. Can the truth be defined as not lying? Yeah, I mean, in the vernacular, mm. that's what we would say. In the it's, vernacular, it's not, but in the essence of it, I don't know if we would do that. In the vernacular, it, sure. Yeah, it, it's it, not really a definition, right? It's kind of a lack of a definition. Mm. Well, but it's it's a question yeah. of representation, yeah. or, I think. Okay, definition in the negative. Well, uh, let's not let's never forget that we are in a Platonic uh, discussion, right? Mm. And when we are speaking of truth and goodness and beauty. It's always about the timeless forms, okay? And it's not about the vernacular. Even if the vernacular can be seen as a specific case in time of that timeless mm -hmm. form, okay? Once again, mm -hmm. the idea of brownness can have many appearances. And the fact mm -hmm. to say the truth in time is a special appearance of the idea of truth. We say truth has no limits. That's a timeless form, okay? In, in the sense that one and the many, okay? I, I come back to your idea of brownness, which is the timeless idea, and the three appearances of brownness that you gave. It could, could be a billion, okay? And in time, when someone is saying the truth, he is manifesting in time a particular, particular case of the timeless form of truth. Can I ask you, uh, I'll just throw out this question here, um, as far as the boundlessness of time. we If we think of something with it that has a duality, like earlier in this dialogue, the idea of uh, hot and cold came up, right? The hot-cold principle. They're, 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 would we all agree that those are opposites of each other? Uh, right? Yeah, but they can yeah. be they, they, they are, they are okay. different too. They're different, but they are, and but and you could say that they're like, you know, they are opposites, but you know, they're different as well. Um, they're different and opposite for sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it, are are they? And and would we say that each one has a claim to exist as well as a as an, as a state of being? Hot Absolutely, and, and that's, yeah, uh, that's right. Okay. Yes, uh, both have that quality of isness. Yeah, and and both in the material world of of and as well as in that higher realm, right? Both of them. Yes. Right. And. Um, yes. And is there a higher category that they both partake in? Temperature. Temperature. Yes. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yes. temperature. Because at first, because the thing I was noticing in 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 this uh, soft dialogue, uh, the the leap is made immediately into being, without first examining. Wait a minute, did we just skip a step? Because earlier on, the question was, well, if um, if we're because I think the issue was was in response to the dualists who believe in the the primordial. Uh, first principle of opposites, right? Of, of hot and cold or motion and, and restfulness. And, and the immediate leap was made into, well, both of them 
partake in being. So is being not thus a third element and thus overthrowing the dualists? And, and so I was like, wait a minute, but you just skipped, you didn't bother asking, well, what about temperature? Now, temperature, does that have an opposite? Is that is there something that is opposite to temperature? Mm -hmm. Right. I can't think of it. I don't know if you guys can. I can't. No, I can't. Yeah. It, it, well, it, it, well, if we, oh. if we, if we, just for the fun of the game. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If we see temperature as a measure of the movement of molecules, mm -hmm. temperature is only a measure. Okay, and it reflects the movement of the molecules. So more fundamentally. Mm -hmm. It's movement versus no movement, but yeah, at yeah. the absolute yeah. zero of minus 273 degrees Celsius. Yeah, the word that came to my mind was stability is the opposite of uh, uh, the, the opposite that we were looking for. But, so but then move, movement, every time we have movement, we have heat. And every time we have lack of movement, we have the absence of heat. because the... less heat or less heat. Yes. So, less so heat no with less movement. So there's still that primordial question Then movement might be itself... Uh, the 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 effect of heat or the cause of heat. I'm not too sure, but either way, we heat it seems present, like yeah. uh, there's definitely an interplay. Um, that's a good point. But I was because I was thinking about the 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 states of reality that have no opposite. So I was like, it, was temperature that or not? I'm not too sure, but definitely something like square doesn't seem to have an opposite. Like there's not square, but you know it doesn't have an opposite as such. It could be like, is it a triangle? No. You know, so you got these like these these qualities that have pure being um, that don't have an opposite. And then we have this other state of of things, so-called, that do have opposites. So there's something useful, I think, about that, especially when approaching questions like what are the vices? How do we define them? They're, they exist. But do they exist as a thing unto themselves or is it kind of like the opposite of uh, or the negation of virtues? Right, like oh, does, the, does... Uh, the, uh, the absence of a simple something relatively to the truth. Mm. Okay, because if you're in truth, once again, what is the fundamental difference between the bio machine and the being? Even if there is a drop of that stuff in the bio machine. What is the difference between the bio machine and what's the other question? And being, okay? Because uh, the aristocratic education is to go beyond the bio machine, okay? The bio machine, once again, is mechanical, is repetitive, is imitative, is normative, is emotionally driven, is sequential. So the stuff that is not the bio machine is characterized by what? By truth? Yeah. Okay. Ideas. Ideas. Okay. Blue senses. Uh, the senses? I thought that the sense of perception is one of the characteristics of the bio machine. Creativity. Of a bio machine. Should we go with Cre the word mind? Okay. Uh, my is layers. Creativity is interesting for me because uh, creativity is certainly not mechanical, it's not repetitive, yeah. it's not imitative, etc. So, uh, creativity seems to be something different from the characteristic of the bio machine. Mm -hmm. Imagination. Okay. Mm -hmm. so is not, is not the, the, the exercise of trying to extract truth from your evidence senses, is that not what differentiates the higher layer? Oh, the actual process of, of discernment. The, the fact that of, we're even having this discussion. Yeah. Is that yes. not proof of the higher layer? Did the bio machine is taking it all in, but we need to find truth. Yeah, we need to okay, discern value Jason, from all the facts that we're... Yes. Mm. And Jason, uh, thank you, because uh, you know that I love uh, fancy words. And when we are, ha we are pondering upon something with a certain distanciation, it's called a meta representation, okay? Because mm -hmm. the bio machine gives us a representation because we have eyes, we have a skin with uh, uh, pressure uh, organs, and we have uh, the sense perception, the intellect, and the social sophistication. So we got facts for the bio machine. But mm -hmm. the fact that we can have, we can step back from the bio machine and look at it. 
what is the stuff that give us that faculty to step back and look at the by machine? What is called that stuff? Come on, that's an There's easy. There's the thing. I inside me, the the I, my soul. Yes, my soul. Is there an, is there an ordinary word for my soul? I I I can only say for me it's I I I. Oh, okay. Anyway, you you got the answer. Okay, I. My favorite word for soul is awareness, but it's only me, okay? I, I, I like awareness. Kelly prefers soul. It's fine with me. So, or I am me. Yeah, but uh, I would stick <laughs> with soul, okay? So that awareness will give you the capacity to have a stepping back from looking at your by machine. So... What is essential in terms of the timeless reality is awareness. And the more you are aware, the more you will be integrated in your being, okay? Which is uh, your true reality, not from uh, the facts coming from the bio machine. Because uh, uh, I think that you're very right uh, uh, 30 minutes ago when we started that conversation to insist on facts, okay? Because when we live in time, we are in a world of facts and we can lie about the facts or we, yeah. can, be, or we can be ignorant about the facts, of course. Yeah. But fundamentally, we live in a world of facts. But we are more than the bio machine. We have awareness. And with that awareness, if we... Uh, got an education okay once again i repeat for the the zillions time educare to bring forth from within okay because from within we have those timeless form okay when you said jason that uh, you don't agree that the universe is the x uh, light years in diameters and uh, we would start a fight about that I said to you that the truth is not about the size of the observable universe, but the truth that we are capable to have a fight for that idea. And that idea is the stuff that you can bring from within, okay? It's one of the timeless form is that you go on your epistemological journey, you will discover, okay? Contrary to the bio machine, where you... you The society, or if you're lucky, or you're aristocratic up. ruler, the, uh, the aristocratic rulers would provide you with good mythology or good narratives, bringing you to the epistemological journey. Okay, because I return to one of the major concepts of the surface. Fantastici, mean, meaning the making of appearance. The making of appearance is not always bad intention. Okay. It, uh, the surface would make uh, narratives with bad intention, but aristocratic rulers would make narratives or mythology with good intention to bring you closer to your epistemological journey. That you understand that your life is not only facts from the bio machine, but also something that can be brought forth from within the timeless forms, the ideas. Mm -hmm. I think that that would be just because unfortunately at 1030, I have an interview, but I think that is a very nice, nice yeah, way to round it out tonight. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. good. Uh, the, the positive, edifying, anti-entropic storytelling. Uh, we have an, a very big absence of that. We need more of that. <laughs> and uh, and I think that's a great way to end this. So uh, until next week, we'll be able to finish it up. And like I said, the most valuable thing with these reading sessions is what happens in between the reading sessions. So people should be going back, rethinking, pondering, taking notes, let it ruminate a little bit, maybe read ahead, guaranteed you're going to get something even if you read ahead twice. By when you before you we meet back up together again, you're going to get something new out of it and it'll mean that much more. So um thank you everybody. So, thank you so much and uh, till next week. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye.